Christ is risen. Do we have a hymn of praise? We do. Our musician is out of town today unexpectedly. <laughs> the wake you up portion of our morning service. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God, whose Son Jesus is the good shepherd of your people, grant that when we hear his voice we may know him who calls us each by name and follow where he leads, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. letter of John. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for one another. How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees a brother or sister in need and yet refuses help? Little children, let us love, not in word or speech, but in truth and action. And by this we will know that we are from the truth and will reassure our hearts before him whenever our hearts condemn us. For God is greater than our hearts, and he knows everything. Beloved, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have boldness before God, and we receive from him whatever we ask, because we obey his commandments and do what pleases him. And this is his commandment, that we should believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as he has commanded us. All who obey his commandment abide in him, and he abides in them. And by this we know that he abides in us by the Spirit that he has given us. The word of the Lord. Welcome to come up. Got Levi coming up here, I know. Or not. <laughs> Levi, I need your help telling this story. Gotta have come on up. Come on up. Crimson's coming over. Hi. I love your shoes. What is your name? Leo? Theo. That's a lot better than Leo. Theo. And what's your name? Calvin and Thea. Thank you for being here. So, <clears throat> this looks like a present. Have y'all ever gotten a Christmas present that looks something like this? No? And you ever shake the box and wonder? You never do that? And this one, it's kind of hard. Usually, presents are softer than this. This one's hard to get into. It's a present, like a lot of the presents you have, but it's a present that was given to you a long time ago. This present was given to you before you were born. And so it's, it can be hard to open, right? So I'm going to try to get it. All right. And it comes in a gold box because it's a very special present. Yeah. This present is a parable. Okay? It's a story, but it's a parable that you can come back to for your help over and over and over and over again. So it's not just a one-time present, it's a many, many times present. So I'm going to see what's in our present, okay? You want to do that with me? You ready? Let's see the first thing we have. We got this. Yeah, what do you think that is? Kind of looks like a putt-putt course. Like grassland, maybe. 
Like a blankie? Yeah, it sure does. Yeah, what else we got? Hmm. That looks like water, right? Yeah. What else do we have here? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. This and this and. Huh. It looks like a sad face, right? Yeah. Maybe there's rocks there. Yeah. What about these? Like a piece of bacon? Mm, no, no, not a piece of bacon. Okay. Dirt, maybe? Yeah. There's a lot of them. Like a square. That's right. You know your shapes for sure. Four equal sides. That's right. Okay, I'm going to do one more la layer here. Oh. Okay. I think this is what we need to get started. So if you're okay, I would like to share this parable with you. Are you all ready to do that? Okay, one more thing and then we're going to start. What do you think it kind of looks like? Like there's walls. Like a whole town could be here. Yeah. I love this. I love it. Okay. So we're going to tell a story. This is the parable. So it begins that there was once this person who did wonderful things and said amazing things. And everybody wanted to know what, who he was. And he would talk about this kingdom. And one time when they asked him, they said, who are you? One time that he said, hey, did you come up right here. Can I have a high five? I'm glad to see you. All right. So one time when they asked him this question, he said, I am the good shepherd. I am the good shepherd. And the sheep know my voice. It looks like a tiger sheep. Kind of kind of does look like a tiger sheep. And when I call the sheep, they follow me. And I lead them to the green green grass that is yummy and I lead them to the fresh cool still what did you say Thea water that's right I'll take a little drink there I even lead them through the dark and dangerous places. And I help them back into the sheepfold. And it's called a sheepfold because sheep are safely folded in there. And when the sheep are back in the sheepfold, I count them. And if they're missing, I go and I find the sheep. And I carry the sheep back to the fold, even though she can be really heavy. Because I am the good shepherd. This shepherd, though, is a hired shepherd, not a good shepherd, right? And when this shepherd leads the sheep, 
kind of lets them do whatever they want here. And they get kind of scattered. And when the wolf comes, this shepherd takes off. But the good shepherd stands between the wolf and the people. Even if it means his own life. So that the sheep can make it safely back to the sheepfold. Now, I wonder, who is this good shepherd? What do you think? Can you think about it a minute? Okay. Anybody else? I wonder who this good shepherd might be. I wonder if you have ever experienced anything like the dark and difficult time. I wonder if you've ever been in the dark and difficult place. I wonder what the fresh, still, good water is. I wonder what that is. What? What do you think? <laughs> like when you feel safe and taken care of? When you got what you need. Yeah. Okay. I wonder if you ever had the chance to follow the Good Shepherd. Well, thank you for helping me tell this parable. So guess what? Um, there are some friends out in the narthex with games and activities. So if you wanna go to the narthex and play games and activities, you can do that. Or you can stay in the sanctuary with your parents. It's, it's up to you. Um, but I'm going to ask you to go and be with those folks now. And for the rest of us, the choir is going to lead us in our sequence hymn. So if everybody will stand, the choir is going to present the sequence hymn. We're going to attempt. <laughs> Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus said, I am the Good Shepherd. The Good Shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. 
The hired hand, who is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. The hired hand runs away because a hired hand does not care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock and one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. I have received this command from my Father. This is the Gospel of the Lord. First John says, we do not love with words, but we love with truth and action. I speak to your name of one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. I'm going to step off camera to get some water. I'm breaking a cardinal rule here. They call this breaking the fourth wall in theater. So Simon, my three-year-old, just had the greatest week of probably his life. He turned three on Wednesday. And presents just poured in. And like every day there was like new presents in the mail. You know. I think if I took this past week of Simon's life and compared it to all human all weeks of every human life in history, it's like in the top one of the top one percent. Like he just had a phenomenal this phenomenal week, which is, which is great. It's, I guess that's how it should be. A um, little bit different about than how I grew up, but I, I love it. I love I love it. And uh, we, we capped this week by uh, yesterday, Casey and I took him to um, the uh, Tennessee Railroad Valley place for um, the Thomas the Train thing. They had Thomas the Train there. Here's how it works. You give them like 50 bucks and they let you on the train for 15 minutes. Kind of how that, how that functions, right? Simon was all about it, he loved it. But Casey and I, uh, misjudged our timing on the day, so Simon was down for a nap. Let him sleep with that nap, but we, we got there like five minutes before the train departed, so we missed our train, had to wait for the next train. And luckily for us, there were activities around that we could participate in, which were great. One of those activities was the, this guy out there folding balloons, doing the balloon thing. And he had a line that stretched about 800 miles to get to him. And, you know, as somebody came up to get their balloon, it was about a five-minute engagement with each person. It was like, which balloon animal do you want? You know, let me show you this, this line. And everybody's waiting and just waiting in line. And Casey and I were lucky because it's two of us, so one of us could take Simon and do something, and the other could hold the place in line. And when Casey came to relieve me, she had Simon with her, she came there and take my place, and I was going to take Simon. I told her, I was like, this lady behind me is trying to weasel her way past me in the line. You need to throw a bow if you need to, to keep this lady in check. Um, this is why I don't wear my collar out, so I can say stuff like that. Um, so we wait in line. I think it's like, literally, I think it's like 20, 25 minutes to get to the front of the line. And Simon's there, and he chooses a bunny. And they fold this bunny, this blue bunny, and man, Simon, I mean, like, balloon animals had loomed large in his consciousness for a while because he was exposed to them months ago, some case he took them to, and he wasn't able to get one, so he's been thinking about them. And, and he was just elated to have this balloon. Um, and we got on the train, and he kept this balloon closed, and he was showing the little balloon animal all the things passing by on the train window. And he was talking as the balloon character. And he talks in this little voice. He has two voices he does. He's got this little voice, and then he's got this demon voice that he does, which is really scary. Um, <laughs> but just in love with this balloon character. And so, had a successful day. We're leaving this place. Casey has to hit the restroom. 
I'm taking him to the car, and he wants to be up on my shoulders, so I put him up on my shoulders, which means one hand has to be, one of his hands has to be occupied holding on to my shoulder, and he does not want to let go of this balloon, right? So, so he didn't let me carry the balloon. I've got Simon. He's got his balloon. And as I'm walking out, you know, I, I hear the, the sound of distress, you know, and the, there's a lady coming forward towards us, and she goes, oh, and I turn around to catch that balloon, to see that balloon hit the ground, and as I'm, like, trying to navigate, not dropping my son to get that balloon, I hear the pop. And Simon just takes this gasp. <gasps> And it, it's still manageable, like it's, it's redeemable, like you pick it up and it kind of looks like a bunny. And so I hand that to Simon, and that was a mistake because that balloon slowly died in his hands. Like, a, like his bunny just dying slowly in his arm. And my three-year-old came undone, just undone. Weepy for the rest of the day. I mean, not french fries, not pizza, not... Setting up the new train set, nothing could take his mind off. He had to call his grandparents and tell them what happened. When we got to the restaurant, he was telling the hostess about it. That's where come down today. I mean, just heartbroken, you know. And of course, as a parent, uh, maybe you're a better parent than me. I, my thing was like, it's a, it's a balloon. But of course, I'm heartbroken because my son is heartbroken. I mean... It's genuinely, it's genuine deep distress that he's experiencing around this. And so, and, and there's nothing we can do, you know, it's, we want to affirm his feelings, but at the same time, we want to sort of coach him into something new and thinking about all the good things that are happening and man, oh man, it was just this hard moment. And as I prayed about that moment later, I was thinking, you know, I wonder if this is our relationship to the divine. I wonder if God looks upon this world that we're sort of wrapped up in and all these things and all these things that we're sort of distressed and up in arms about and, and things. Well, it's just a balloon, but the heart of God is broken because our heart is broken. Right? What if it works that way? I think whoever wrote First John, let's call him John, um, whoever wrote that, uh, Johnny there, I think he's trying to convey something like this, right? Something like, you think all these issues that you are facing as a community are of utmost importance, but what really matters is that God did this thing on your behalf and loves you deeply and calls you into that love, right? I think John has, so just to be clear about what we're talking about here, so um, Paul read for us from First John, right? So 1 John, it's called 1 John because there's two others. Uh, there's 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And these are three what we call Catholic epistles. And the reason we call them Catholic epistles is not because they came from the Catholic Church. We call them that because they are they are universally sort of uh, addressed. Um, instead of being addressed to a community in Corinth or a person like Timothy or something like that, they're just, they're, there's no, it's open-ended. It's like, this is for everybody. Um, and there's several of these. There's Titus, 1st, 2nd Peter. There's, there's several of these in the New Testament. Um, but we call them Catholic epistles, and, and they pose a little bit of a challenge in terms of interpreting them, which is what I like to do before I preach on them, because there's no context to draw from there. You kind of have to sort of like invent the context. You have, to, you have to assume the context. So he's not writing to the Corinthians or the Ephesians or uh, the church in Thessalonica. He's writing to the church. John is, to a community, a nameless community, and saying as, as you move in the direction away from the Easter moment, the moment of resurrection, and the joy of that moment, as you move away from that, all these trivial things are going to come into the life of the church, and you have to learn how to navigate those. And he says you have two tools. You have two tools to do that with, two things. And I believe that as I read about these, as I thought about these two things that John is really thinking about, um, that like a lot, some Christians are okay with one of those, and other Christians are okay with the other one, and few Christians are okay with both of them. And then if we're really honest with ourselves, no Christians are really good with any of it, that we have to do a ton of work, right? And one of them is, and this is, be prepared, this is the one that I think, like in this camp, we're all perfectly fine with. John is saying that um, to, 
to move into a deeper, more profound, more meaningful relationship with the person Christ, to hold on to the Easter moment. What you need is practical, enfleshed, radical love. That this is what Jesus did. Jesus came into the world in physical way and did physical things on behalf of people who were suffering. That was loving. And to be a part of this movement, you too have to do that. You too. And I think most Episcopalians are like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We've got the Mark submission. You know, we're, we're the church of doing. We do the radical love. You know, you can run across any Episcopalian knows that. They'll say, you know, St. Francis says that preach the gospel and if necessary, use words. Everybody thinks they're really smart for knowing that little adage. And they are. It's good. It's a good adage to have, right? But if you, if you hear that from somebody, you know they're Episcopalian. Um, this idea that, that we do the gospel not with our words, but with, with our actions, which is John is, up, is saying that. Okay? So that's, that's one pillar in John. The second pillar is to believe deeply and trust the name of Jesus. Proclaim the name of Jesus. And I think some parts of the, of the Episcopal Church and other mainline traditions get a little bit, they're like, well, we don't want to exclude anybody. So we're going to be careful about how we talk about this. But for John, no other name works. Because this is the name that represents the truth that God comes in flesh among us. And not only comes in flesh among us, but comes in flesh among us and then gives himself over in humility and in love. Which is the second part of what we have to do. We have to trust that God is going to do that work on our behalf over and over and over again. The trouble, of course, is that as we move away from the Easter moment, right, it gets more difficult. And this happens in microcosm. So I was telling the 8 o'clock crowd that, like, this is Easter 5. Is that where we're at? Easter 4. Easter 4. It's the fourth Sunday in Easter. So for four, we are four Sundays away from Easter, right, from the Easter proper. And um, you, I look around here, there's about 25 of you in this room, right? If you remember back to Easter morning, there was about 95 of you in this room, right? It's a different experience, right? It's a different experience. And so, <laughs> as Christians, I think we experience these things. We come in contact with, with the loving and, and the resurrected Christ in a way that is profoundly meaningful in our, in our lives. And then all of a sudden, we have to figure out dinner this week. And it's not as fun anymore, right? All these sort of quotidian challenges get in our way. And all of a sudden, the radical love, the proclaiming Jesus, they become a little bit more obscure, a little bit more abstract, a little bit more separated, right? And so what we do in response to that is we, we facilitate this experience here, right? Where we come Sunday by Sunday and we sing these songs and we read these stories and we come to this altar and we participate in this ritual, right? We do these things because they hold for us that truth, right? But the, we, sometimes we forget that the reason that we're holding that truth in the first place is so that we can act on it in our day-to-day -day life. So that we can believe that the person that we encounter that doesn't look or think or talk or smell or behave, anything that we thought Jesus might be, that that person, the spark of Christ is in that person. And we owe that person our love, not because they have earned our respect, but because they are created and beloved. That's why, right? And that becomes hard and harder to do. So I experienced something like this. Uh, right, right after seminary, I had this dear friend, uh, Bob Leopold, priest in the church. He's moved to Maine now. Uh, no, to Vermont, sorry. Um, but he had started this religious, or this, this uh, um, uh, church experience here in town called Southside Abbey. And Southside Abbey, uh, when it first started, it was meeting at the Hart Gallery on Main Street there, and it was focus was all about doing ministry work in the South Side, and uh, being church to people who don't like church, which that sounds great on its front. So being church to people who don't like church, and so they got rid of a lot of the trappings of church. They didn't meet in a church building. They didn't meet on Sundays. Uh, they didn't use a lot of the jargon and everything that they did. So so any type of worship engagement was followed up with a practical ministry engagement in the community. Um, and a lot of people sort of connected with this thing, and it was dinner church, so they would come on Friday nights, and some people would bring a bunch of food, and they would share a meal together. And, um, and slowly what happened over time was, as they shared that meal, um, people who were experiencing homelessness 
found out and started participating. And then over the years, it went from like 10% people who are homeless to 20, to like 50-50. And now I think Southside Addy meets at St. Paul's Episcopal Church and it's a feeding ministry for people who are facing homelessness. That's what the Holy Spirit turned that into. But that's not how it started, and that was a hard transition, especially for Bob. But when Bob and I were doing, were working together on that, I was working at St. Timothy's, and I would come and help him do stuff, and I would participate on Friday nights, and one time he asked me to um, step in in his absence. And it was Christmas time, and it was after Christmas, and he had left out of town, and I was there at Southside Abbey all by myself one Friday night, and this was the Friday after Christmas, and so it was like the Sunday after Christmas, and th that's the readings that we used. And um, if, you, if you don't know, the, the readings that we use, the Sunday after Christmas, it's the same gospel every year. It's the first chapter of the Gospel of John. And if, if, you're, if that isn't pulled to memory exactly what that is right now, let me tell you. Um, it's the prologue, it's this poem, and the poem begins something like, in the beginning there was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God, right? And it's this sort of very elaborate, very beautiful piece of poetry um, that extends most of the way through that first chapter. And there's part of that, that, that poem that's, that where, where the poem says, and God, taber that God became enfleshed and tabernacled among us. That is, if, if you were to translate that woodenly, what you would say is lived among us. Or you might say God pitched God's tent among us. That's what tabernacling literally means to pitch his tent. Uh, but we take, take it for the meaning, I think most translations say something like, came and dwelt or lived among us, right? And so the way the Southside Abbey worked is um, you'd show up and you had to set this place up because it was in a heart, it was, in, it was in the art gallery. So you had to set it up and you had to get all the materials together. Um, you didn't have a deacon like I have here usually who does everything. You know, like, you have to do all this stuff. You have to find all this stuff. And so I get there this Friday and there's no... <laughs> can't find anything. Like I'm looking for chairs for people to sit in, and I set up the tables, and because um, we're going to eat a meal, and I'm looking for the patent and the cup and um, the stuff that we're going to I can't find hardly anything. And, um, and I get everything together, finally, like, with maybe a minute to spare. And the one thing that I could not find was, like, the wafers to do communion with. And we're eating pizza that night, so I'm, like, tearing pizza crust off, which I'm completely scandalized by. Like, just, like, this is awful. And so, so the, the order of service is this. So you, um, uh, you say some prayers together. Um, you welcome everybody in. You say some prayers. And then the priest gives a, and, and does a consecratory prayer, like a, a communion prayer over the bread. And then the bread is shared. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. You go around the room. You do that. And then everybody takes the bread. And then everybody gets up and gets a meal. And they go back and sit down. And the, the scripture for that day is read. And then there's a holy conversation, and after the holy conversation, the wine is consecrated, and everybody drinks a little bit of wine. And then we say some more prayers, and people are dismissed, and that's kind of the, the order of how they do things. A little bit different than how we do things here. So I'm saying the consecratory prayer over the pizza crust, so I'm already in pretty bad shape. And all of a sudden, this person walks in the back door, and he's on his cell phone, and he's talking at this volume nonstop. I'm like, does he know what I'm doing up here with my hands like this? Somebody needs to tell that guy that this is the Eucharist. And so I'm sitting here doing this thing, and he's just continuing on, just having this conversation. Um, and then it gets to communion, and I'm going around giving people the body of Christ, bread of heaven, body of Christ, bread of heaven. And I get to this guy. I see that he has a teardrop tattoo, right? And I go to give him the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. I say that, and he says to me, he says, I don't want that S word. And I, um, I was in such a place at that moment that I came within a hair's length of being like, get out. You, get, you need to leave. I almost kicked him out. Something stopped me from doing that. I just walked on and gave the next person communion. And then we read the scripture, right? And the scripture is this thing from 1 John, the, the, or from the, the Gospel of John, this first, first chapter of John, this prologue and the tent and everything. And the way that works is we read the scripture together, and then I say something, and then I ask a question to get feedback. And so I read it, and the thing that I say is the thing that I told you about the tent, right? 
And, um, and I ask a question. Some people are giving some feedback and talking a little bit. And the teardrop, he's come off the phone, and he raises his hand. And I'm like, I'm not going <laughs> to call this. So I, but I do, I acknowledge this person. And he pulls out of his pocket this poem he's written. And he reads the poem. And the poem is about being homeless, that it is important to pitch your tent among folks that you trust. And that's where you find your safety, is pitching your tent among folks that you love. And that God always pitches God's tent with us. Teardrop tattoo guy said that. That's the guy who brought the gospel of Jesus Christ into that room, right? And I was the guy that almost kicked him out because of the religious stuff, right? Okay. First John, whoever read that, knows this impulse in us. That we want to be close to that Easter moment. We want to be connected to it. Right? We want to feel it all the time. And that we will invent rules and rituals and places that will bring us in closer proximity to that moment. And John is fine with those, as should we be. But we cannot lose sight of these are not the things that are the Easter moment. They are things that approximate us to the Easter moment. The Easter moment exists in our willingness to radically, self-sacrificially love the world around us, which is something that we're going to have to embrace, especially in a year like this one. So I'm going to preach this to all three services, so both churches. Um, the vestries of St. Albans and St. Thaddeus will meet this week to talk about a merger. Um, they'll both meet to, to vote on that. And I don't know how that will turn out. My sense is that um, they will call us into a relationship together. But whatever they choose, we have some difficult challenges ahead. But we also have some great opportunities. Right? It will require of us to remember what we are approximating ourselves to. That is radical love in this world. And what I'm convinced about about these two communities, right, St. Albans, St. Thaddeus, is that what exists in the heart of those people is the capacity, is the willingness to do that radical love in the world. But it will require us to let go a little bit of the trappings around that, right? To hold those things loosely in this moment. First John, uh, they call him the, uh, what's the word they use? Well, the elder, the person who wrote First John. He knows this to be true about that little Christian community, right? That they're going to start fighting and bickering and um, getting in each other's way around these uh, um, these unimportant matters, right? But what he's calling them into is this sense that what God did in the person Jesus was to love them radically, right, despite themselves. And is calling them to do the same thing. And is calling us, thousands of years later, separated from that moment, to do the same thing, to love radically. Amen. United in the hope and joy of the resurrection, let us pray for the church, the world, and all who are in need. God of rebirth, the good news of your resurrection brings refreshment to a weary world. Following the woman at the tomb, empower us to boldly share your radical love through our words and our work. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy. As you breathed your spirit into the disciples, breathe your spirit of healing upon all creation. Nourish the earth with sufficient rains. Strengthen us to counter the effects of pollution and destruction. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. You prepared the disciples for their ministry, calming their fears and granting them your peace. Equip our community leaders Give them a spirit of peace and hearts that burn for justice, that their leadership reflects your love. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. 
You come among us in unexpected ways. Send us to those who hide in fear or question your love. Be a healing presence for any isolated by addiction, incarceration, mental illness, chronic pain, sickness, or grief, especially Gianna, Gabby, Mitch, Susan, Ellen, Henson, George, Tim, Jamie, Craig, Ben, Janet, Marianne, Christy, Henry, Justin, Anne, Janice, Tony, Leslie, Susan, Dale, Cindy, Anthony, Jason, Raymond, Elaine, Nelson, and Randy. Hear us, O oh God. As you met the disciples on the road to Emmaus, show us your presence along our journeys. Bless our doubts and questions. Provide trusting and safe relationships for all ages to nurture your connection to you and one another. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Resurrecting God, you bring us to new life every day. Thank you for blessing us with companions on our faith journey especially those who now rest in your love. Strengthen us with the eternal peace of your promises. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Rejoicing in the victory of Christ's resurrection, we lift our prayers and praise to you, almighty and eternal God. We pray all this through Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Amen. Amen. Friends, the peace of the Lord be always with you. say a few quick things. One, um, thank you and welcome um, for being here, uh, both to the folks who are in the room and people who are online with us. Um, if we don't know you, we would like to get to know you better, and so we can do that if you fill out one of those cards. Uh, and then if you're online, the cards are in the pew back. If you're online, there's an email there that you can reach out to, and, um, and then somebody will reach back out to you. That somebody would be me reach back out to you from the church. So we're just really glad that you're here and among us today. Um, a few quick things to know about. One, uh, the, the youth group is continuing to meet, so they'll meet today at 5 o'clock at the church. Um, the vestries of St. Albans and St. Thaddeus are meeting this week. Thaddeus is meeting today after the 1130 service at 1 o'clock, so I ask you to pray for them. Albans will meet at Wednesday at 7 o'clock. Just weird people meet at weird times. It's great. It's great. And we will uh, have a vote. Um, and as soon as that sort of plays out, you will know uh, uh, what that means, and then we'll bring everybody together and have a conversation about next steps. So what they're, just to be clear, what, what they're not voting on is the wet, when, how. So it's not like, okay, we're going to, on this Sunday, we're going to be here and doing this thing. Instead, what they're going to vote on is um, to invite the bishop's office to lead them into a process by which the two churches merge together. Um, so at the end of that process, there won't be a St. Albans and St. Thaddeus. There will be one new entity. So that's what they're voting on today. Um, and how that plays out will be work that they do over the next several, several weeks with, uh, with the help of the diocese and other places. So, um, so please be praying for the vestries as they engage in that work. Uh, today and on Wednesday. Um, the Episcopal 101 course has picked up again. It's on Sunday mornings at 9 o'clock. This morning we talked about hermeneutics, which, you know, man, like, tell your friends at a party about hermeneutics. You'll gain friends and influence people that way. Um, so it's, it's actually a lot of fun, I think, to have these conversations. They're open-ended. Um, they don't build on each other, so... Um, if you've missed all of them, then you can come or, um, as you want. 
Um, but we'll publish a schedule around that so you know what we're, what we're, what we're talking about. But those are Sunday mornings at 9 o'clock. One more thing that I, I definitely need to say is that for the time being, that half of the building is off limits. There's um, uh, the Sunday school ring and the, the administrative wing. And the, the damage that was done by a small fire over there is being rem remediated at this point. And um, uh, thanks to Dan and for John for coordinating that work. Um, but that work is now being executed in that side of the building. So the, um, as that progresses, we will, we will keep you informed about accessing that side of the building. Are there any birthdays or anniversaries we're celebrating this week? Okay, walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us in an offering and a sacrifice to the Most High. I need somebody to bring the elements forward if they would be willing to do that. I should mention that um, Deacon Bill is doing fine. Um, he had a procedure to remove some of um, some spots on his on his face, but he's recovering well. Um, and Michael, our musician, also doing okay, is out of town. But definitely, as you can tell, they're missed in our service. So, yeah, yeah. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. All thanks and praise are yours at all times and in all places, our true and loving God. Through Jesus Christ, your eternal word, the wisdom from on high, by whom you created all things. You laid the foundations of the world and enclosed the sea when it burst forth from the womb. You brought forth all creatures of the earth and gave breath to humankind. Wondrous are you, Holy One of blessing. All that you create is a sign of hope for our journey. And so, as the morning stars sing your praises, we join the heavenly beings and all creation as we shout with joy and sing.
Glory and honor are yours, creator of all. Your word has never been silent. You called a people to yourself as a light to the nations. You delivered them from bondage and led them to a land of promise. Of your grace, you gave Jesus to be human, to share our life and to proclaim the coming of your holy reign and give himself for us a fragrant offering. Through Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, you have freed us from sin, brought us into your life, reconciled us to you and restored us to the glory you intended for us. We thank you that on the night he died for us, Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it, gave it to his friends and said, take, eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, Jesus took the cup of wine, said the blessing, gave it to his friends and said, drink this, all of you. This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood, poured out for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. And so remembering all that has been done for us, the cross, the tomb, the resurrection, and the ascension, longing for Christ's coming in glory and presenting to you these gifts that earth has formed and human hands have made. We acclaim you, O Christ. Dying, you destroyed our death. Rising, you restored our life. Christ Jesus, come in glory. Send your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these gifts of bread and wine, that may, they may be to us the body and blood of your Christ. Grant that we, burning with your Spirit's power, may be a people of hope, justice, and love. Giver of life, draw us together in the body of Christ. And in the fullness of time, gather us with blessed Alban and all your people into the joy of our true eternal home. Through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, we worship you, our God and Creator, in voices of unending praise. Blessed are you now and forever. Amen. And as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. You, the people of God, come taste and see that God is good. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. The blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. The blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. The body of our Lord Jesus Christ, keep you in everlasting life. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. This is the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. The body of our Lord Jesus Christ, keep you in everlasting life. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven.
Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, accept that us as our of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Fed us with spiritual food and the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Friends, life is short and we do not have long to gladden the hearts of those who take the journey with us. So be quick to be kind and make haste to forgive. And the blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you this Sunday and remain with you always. Amen. To praise the risen one.